Hello and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, Israel signs a major gas deal with Jordan. Some American Muslim leaders condemn Hamas on behalf of Israel, and ILTV has a scoop on how Sweden and Israel are planning to improve ties. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here with the latest news in Israel. The former president of Israel, Shimon Peres, is in critical condition yet again. Doctors are now saying the sedated Israeli leader's condition has seriously deteriorated over the past 24 hours. The 93-year-old leader has been hospitalized in the Sheba Medical Center near Tel Aviv since mid-September after suffering a stroke. His condition initially seemed to improve after he entered the hospital, but now doctors are saying that he could be headed for multiple organ failure. Paris's breathing, kidney function, and several other indexes have dropped over the past 24 hours, raising serious concerns. It appears as though the leader is now suffering from endema. Shimon Peres served as a former prime minister and president of Israel and has a political career that has spanned over seven decades. The Israeli leader has become a symbol of the Jewish state as one of the oldest statesmen to have continued playing a role in the Israeli government. Well, anyone hoping to see fireworks during the 2016 presidential debates wasn't disappointed by the often contentious exchange between the two candidates. The 90-minute live broadcast was charged from the start as Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton tangled with her Republican challenger Donald Trump. The two focused on the American economy, international trade, and the racial tension currently plaguing the states. They criticized each other's temperament and potential ability to govern as a country's 45th president. Well, I have much better judgment than she does. There's no question about that. I also have a much better temperament than she has. You know, I have a much better. She spent, let me tell you, she spent hundreds of millions of dollars on an advertising. You know, they get Madison Avenue into a room, they put names, oh, temperament, let's go after. I think my strongest asset maybe by far, is my temperament. I have a winning temperament. I know how to win. She does not have, know how to win. Clinton. Wait, the AFL-CIO the other day, <clears throat> behind the blue screen, I don't know who you were talking to, Secretary Clinton, but you were totally out of control. I said, there's a person with a temperament that's got a problem. And my successor, John Kerry, and President Obama got a deal that put a lid on Iran's nuclear program without firing a single shot. That's diplomacy, that's coalition building, that's working with other nations. The other day, I saw Donald saying that there were some Iranian sailors on a ship in the waters off of Iran and they were taunting American sailors who were on a nearby ship. He said, you know, if they taunted our sailors, I'd blow them out of the water and start another war. That's that would not, not good judgment. That is not the right temperament to be commander-in-chief. As far as controversies dogging the candidates, Clinton's email scandal came up only briefly, as did Trump's involvement in the so-called birther movement, questioning whether current President Barack Obama was born in the U.S. Clinton stressed her decades of leadership experience as former senator and secretary of state, while Trump touted his background as an out-party candidate and successful businessman. Israel was only mentioned in passing when Trump brought up his talks with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu this past Sunday, when the Israeli leader met with both candidates while visiting New York. The GOP nominee said, Believe me, Bibi Netanyahu is not a happy camper, in apparent reference to the 2015 Iran deal. As far as who won, well, it will take days to conduct the necessary rigorous studies. But early polls show Clinton came out on top. Two more presidential debates are slated to be held on October 9th and 19th, just weeks before the final showdown at the polls on November 8th. Israel is about to become the largest supplier of natural gas to Jordan after clinching an unprecedented $10 billion deal with the neighboring country. 
The Leviathan Consortium has just agreed to meet the Hashemite Kingdom's gas needs for a 15-year period. The consortium, whose members include Israel's Delek Group and the U.S.-based Noble Energy Corporation, signed the deal with the Jordan Electric Power Company yesterday. Under terms of the pact, nearly 1,600 billion cubic feet of gas will be pumped from the Leviathan offshore field in the Mediterranean Sea to Israel's neighbor and peace partner. <laughs> וכמובן, בדיוק בשביל זה קידמנו את מתווה הגז. אנחנו מוצאים את הגז מהאדמה, והמדינה מרוויחה את הפירות הגיאופוליטיים, הכלכליים והחברתיים האדירים שטמונים בגז. It's not yet clear who will build the 16-mile pipeline to carry the precious resource, however, which was one of the sticking points during negotiations. It's hoped that the massive oil field will go online by 2019. It was discovered six years ago and is believed to hold at least 18.9 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, in addition to some 34.1 million barrels of condensate. Jerusalem believes the reserves found in Leviathan and the nearby Tamar gas fields have the potential to generate billions of dollars in tax revenues and help Israel develop energy self-sufficiency on the road to becoming a regional energy powerhouse. Israel will become an important player in the energy market and this will enable us also to develop, to discover and to develop additional gas fields that are waiting uh, to be explored in uh, the Israeli economic waters. In addition to supplying Jordan with a clean and inexpensive product, Israel is now reportedly holding gas exportation talks with Turkey and Egypt, and perhaps somewhat surprisingly to the Palestinians and even the European Union. That's pretty impressive for a country that has no oil and little water on its own landmass. Israel is a thriving democracy, but it's also a Jewish state, and since 1948, the government has been trying to maintain a balance between the two. These past few weeks, observance of the Sabbath has been one of the main issues in the Israeli political scene, and ILTV's Steve Leibowitz sat down with Liat Collins, the international editor of the Jerusalem Post, to find out more about how the issue will affect the future of Israel's identity. Well, the Jerusalem Post reports that Minister Katz says that the Shabbat scandal will not bring him down. Shabbat scandal, all that he did, in effect, was allow some work to be done on Saturday that had to be done in order to protect the public. Why, why should that be a political scandal? Well, one, always it's very touchy, the subject of, of working on, on the Sabbath and what actually is necessary under this uh, guideline of pikuach nefesh, the idea of saving a, a soul rather than for convenience. And, you know, that's a specific uh, category which rabbis uh, really determine more than the government ministers. I think also the um, ultra-Orthodox were m more upset with the procedure around it, the idea of there being a press conference and photos being taken from the air at the same time, which is much harder to, uh, to justify from a, a point of view of necessity. Um, I, I also don't think it's going to bring him down or the government down. Him slightly more only in the sense maybe there's a political, political war between him and, and the Prime Minister. Uh, and there's no love lost there lately, so I think possibly also with the um, the coalition parties, the ultra orthodox party, this may be the first shoe. I don't think they were looking to exacerbate this into, into a full blown coalition crisis, but I think it's a subject that might be used against the the current government, against uh, Netanyahu or against uh, uh, Katz later on, the further down the line. I think it's more. Uh, sort of a form of ammunition than anything else. Well, Prime Minister Netanyahu, I probably remembers back to the famous turbine uh, incident, which ended up bringing down his government when a turbine was moved. <clears throat> but in Israel, everything is closed. All workplaces are closed. Entertainment places are open. There are no public buses running. Considering that the ultra-Orthodox are really a, a minority in the population, aren't they uh, isn't it chutzpah for them to try to dictate to the rest of the secular people what should and shouldn't be on Saturday? Um, what, I, I don't think it's chutzpah because that uh, uh, keeping Shabbat, as you said, like the, the fact that things are closed uh, and it's certainly the difference in pace, 
that's actually what makes Israel Israel. That's what makes the Jewish state the Jewish state. And if we didn't have that, um, to some extent, it, it, it just wouldn't be the same country. It certainly wouldn't be the same Jewish country uh, that that it, it's meant to be, and that that's what we love it for, really. Uh, and by the way, I, th I think the uh, first uh, political crisis was probably the uh, uh, F-15s that arrived slightly after Shabbat in right. the... Uh, so there's a history it, of Shabbat issues being right. used by the ultra-Orthodox to cause a coalition crisis or when they need one. Right, or, or, or even, in fact, the government in, in power also. I think Rabin himself called for early elections after the F, uh, F-15 uh, fiasco, as it were, because he thought he could go into elections from a uh, strength, from a position of strength, um, which didn't happen. And I think, actually, over the years, um, and s certainly Netanyahu has learned to be more cautious about that. I don't think he's going to want to... Uh, uh, bring forward elections if he can't, if he really doesn't have to. A secular person during the summertime would probably like to go to the beach. And let's say he doesn't have much money, he's not a wealthy person, he doesn't have money for taxis. He's used to taking the bus to go places. He has to take the bus, so otherwise he has nowhere to go anywhere. I mean, you would think that there are a lot of secular, poor people in the country that are angry and that would vote to make changes in the country, but that doesn't seem to ever happen. Um, well, again, it's a part of. I mean, the, the, we, it's not a um, monolithic kind of thing. It's not homogenous. I, I know so many people who who go to synagogue and, and then go to the beach, or uh, and so there's that whole um, variation of, of views and and uh, and ways of looking at it. And I, I think again, people want to keep that that slight difference of, of, of Shabbat and Sabbath from any other day. It's the same with Yom Kippur, for example. And I always think that if ever, heaven forbid, there was an actual law banning people from driving on Yom Kippur, that year people would be on the road. The fact that there isn't a law that makes you have to stop driving on Yom Kippur is the reason people abide by it. And I think even secular, non-religious people uh, enjoy that that day of, of a, a for introspection in their own way, marking it as a different day, and I think also marking the Sabbath in a, in a, as a different day. That's a, a a holy day separate from the regular weekday. I think that's a, very much in force here still. Well, Liat Collins, twenty eight years at the Jerusalem Almost. Post. <laughs> Almost 28 years covering the news in Israel at the Jerusalem Post. Thanks so much for being with us at ILTV. Thank you so much. In a show of unusual support for Israel, a group of Muslim leaders in the United States is now appealing to Hamas to return the bodies of two IDF soldiers to the Jewish state. The remains of Oron Shaul and Hadal Goldin were seized and dragged into Gaza by Hamas operatives after they were killed in the 2014 conflict between Hamas and Israel. So far, the terrorist rulers of the Palestinian territory have refused all appeals for their release. Congressman Keith Ellison and Andre Carson have joined eight other prominent American Muslims in pushing Hamas to return the bodies. The leaders have sent a letter to the Hamas political chief Khaled Mashal, citing Islamist religious texts in hopes of encouraging his organization to do the right thing. They've written that the Holy Quran reminds us that whoever pardons and makes reconciliation will receive his reward from Allah, saying Hamas should act upon these words and allow the Goldin and Shaul families to bury their loved ones. The group has acknowledged that both Israelis and Palestinians have felt the pain of war and of losing loved ones and children far too soon. The letter was sent on September 21st, but has just been made public by its initiator, Rabbi Mark Schneier, who heads a Foundation for Ethnic Understanding. Meanwhile, another group in the United States has just published a very different kind of letter calling for a boycott of any Jewish goods or services coming from the West Bank. The letter has been signed by more than 70 people considered to be American intellectuals and will appear in the latest issue of the New York Review of Books. What's kind of interesting is that instead of a blanket movement against the Jewish state, which is most common in the BDS movement, this petition is clear that any products produced within the 1967 lines should not be targeted. Yet the letter also demands that all Jewish companies located in the West Bank be stripped of U.S. tax exemptions and barred from receiving any Israeli trade benefits. 
looking for a home security mobile system, a way to measure clothes when shopping online, or a cool new game to download on your phone? The Israeli company Zemingo Group may be able to help you find the app of your dreams. Robert Prishku is the company's VP of Business Development, and he's here with the scoop. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. So to begin, tell us about your company. What do you guys do? So um, Zemingo Group is uh, the largest mobile service house in Israel. Uh, we are a one-stop shop for developing mobile applications. Today it's more like mobile platforms. Um, and we do everything from the phase of the idea to the helping you with the market of the application after it's developed. So we take on the full cycle of the design, the development, and the marketing for mobile apps uh, for our customers. Interesting. So can you give us an example? I mean, what, what is your latest development for? So as a company, I think that we are pioneers in, um, in the field of uh, application for connected devices. We call it the field of AOT, apps of things. It's, uh, it's some kind of a subset of the IoT. Everybody knows the IoT, that almost every device today is being censored and is being connected to the web. And there is this field of taking those devices that were once dumb and turning them to smart devices. And this is our focus as a company. So, for example, we've developed things like connecting uh, security cams and uh, connecting smart glasses to apps. But we also connected uh, sensors on diapers. We also uh, turned uh, drones into drones that can be autonomous and being activated from the palm of your uh, of your hand. Um, we have turned uh, things like uh, blood pressure measurements and glucometers into smart devices that can automatically um, transform the information to the doctors using the cloud. Um, and this is our world. So what, in your yeah. opinion, what is one of the coolest apps that uh, your company has helped create so far? Okay, so one of my recent um, favorites, and also it's, it's a school because I've just spoken on the phone and I can, I can say that uh, they're, they're now out of what's called stealth mode. Okay, so um, this is totally new. Yeah, this is totally new. So uh, there's uh, the project we've done with a very innovative startup called, they're called uh, themselves Go, 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 uh, Go Fitch. Okay. Go okay, so it's like go fetch, but it's for it's it's for fa it's for uh, fishing, and uh, the the amazing thing there is that there's this whole thing that's called uh, fishing when you're doing it away from shore. So there's no way to throw this um, the anchor into the water far away. So basically, they're using a drone, they're connecting the drone, and using your only your mobile device without any control. You don't need to know to find drones or everything. You just do a swipe of your finger, and it just goes into the water, throws in the the uh, the anchor to catch the fish and comes back automatically. So this is one of the things that we've done. Wow, okay, so wait, let's explain, <laughs> let's back this up for a second. So this okay. is a drone that is essentially see, seeing a certain location in the water and mm -hmm. helping you reach your line out to that specific location? Exactly. So you, you're Can doing it just see the fish line. in advance? No, 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 no. It just, okay. it's just throwing the line because if you throw it by hand, you can only reach like 10, 20, 30 meters. So using the drone, you can get like 500 meters, but Obviously, if you're fishing, you don't want to know how to fly a drone. So wow. we, we've built the whole experience. It's not just building the app. We built the whole experience of uh, doing it with a single swipe. And that's, you know, that's part of what we consider our domain expertise, because these guys came in with their, with their ideas. They knew that they had to be operated by an app. But how will this app connect? How it will interconnect? Um, it, you know, everything was done by us. What does the future hold for the Israeli technological market now that we're seeing you know, these apps that you're creating with smartphones? So it, it's an excellent question. Um, I think that we are only in the beginning of this revolution that we call AOT, apps of things, because most of the companies that are turning physical devices into smart devices today, um, they, they focus on their product and they are not tapping enough into the capabilities of the mobile because a mobile device is more than a remote control for your device, as most companies see it. It's, it can measure and learn everything around you, and you can use it. For example, you can, I can tell, because you have an app, I can tell where you are, what's the temperature outside, uh, what you did recently. Um, it's connected to the, to the web, so I can take everything from the web to enhance the, ex to, to, to enhance the, um, the experience of the app. Um, it's personal, so I can do a different app for men and women, children and adults. Um, it's social, so I can tell you how you're doing compared to others. Very popular with, uh, with all those uh, fitness trackers. Um, I can communicate with the users. 
that's that's a big revolution. I mean, if I until now I was a physical product company, now I can actually communicate with the with the users. I can segment them. I can tell you know users from different groups, and I can communicate with them individually. It's something that physical product company never had, um, and and I can improve because I can upload a new firmware. I can actually improve the physical device after it's left the factory. It's a revolution. Well, it looks like you guys are leading that revolution. Thank you so We're much trying. for coming in. <laughs> Thank you so much. Israeli-Swedish relations have seemed to deteriorate since Sweden became the first member of the EU to recognize the state of Palestine in 2014. Since then, the Swedish foreign minister has come under fire for being biased against Israel in international forums, creating an even deeper rift between Swedes and Israelis. So how can this relationship be mended? I sat down with the CEO of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, Ms. Maria Ranka, to find out. What do Stockholm and Tel Aviv have in common? The weather may not exactly be the same, but Swedish power woman Maria Ranka says both cities are far more similar than we may realize. Both Tel Aviv and Stockholm, they are characterized by these three T's, uh, talent access, technology and trade. And we're also size-wise very well positioned. So I think uh, Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv and Stockholm, if our two cities play our cards in a smart way, uh, will have a, a bright future. The CEO of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce is in Israel to participate in the 7th annual Tel Aviv City Summit, a festival focused on promoting Israel's technology and innovation. Israel has one of the highest concentrations of startups in the world, and Stockholm, Sweden, happens to be the fastest growing capital in Europe, with the second strongest unicorn factory after Silicon Valley per capita. It's for this reason that Ranka believes Israel and Sweden have a strong foundation from which to improve economic ties. I think there is room for much more collaboration. Uh, a lot of uh, big Swedish companies are already present in Israel and of course a few smaller and medium-sized companies as well. But if we look at the technological side, uh, you are a technological champion and uh, Stockholm and Sweden is also considered world leading in, uh, in technologies. So um, if I could wish for something, that would be more exchange between startups. Yet many question if Israel and Sweden can truly collaborate in the face of their weak political relations. The Swedish Foreign Minister Margot Wallström has repeatedly enraged Israel since 2014 for her attacks on security matters in the Jewish state. Last November, she identified the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as one of the factors explaining why so many people have become radicalized. Then in December, she called on Israel to halt what she referred to as extrajudicial executions in the country's response to attacks by Palestinian terrorists. Later, the Swedish foreign minister demanded thorough investigations into how the Israeli army responds to Palestinian terror attacks. For a while, the Israeli government made it clear that the Swedish leader wasn't welcome in Israel. But in March, Wallström appeared to experience a change of heart towards the Jewish state. After a meeting with Israeli minister Tsipi Livni, Wallström agreed to publicly denounce the BDS movement against the Jewish state, a move that Sweden's business community seems to be on board with. If you ask me, me and if you ask the business community in Sweden, uh, we are generally not uh, in favor of economic boycotts. And one reason is that uh, looking, it's actually very, very rare for an economic boycott to work the way the boycotters want it to work, so it's inefficient. So what is the key to improving Israel's relationship with Sweden? Maria Ranka seems to have the key trade, tourism, and uh, a number of exchange programs, I think it, it could help because, um, you know, you need, to, you need to know each other in order to, to, uh, to nourish a strong relationship. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. Everybody on earth has their favorite city, so today's word is Il, which means city in Hebrew. Tel Aviv happens to be the largest Il in Israel, and Israelis even call it Il Lelo Afsaka, or the city that never stops. And believe me when I tell you that's true, the famous Il is known for its incredible nightlife. Now, they say no city should be too large for a person to walk out of in the morning, and the good thing is that Tel Aviv isn't too big. If you're planning on visiting Israel, 
Israel and want to check out a different type of Ir, head out to Ir HaKodesh, or the Holy City, otherwise known as Jerusalem. It's just 45 minutes away. And if you want to get a whole different taste of Israel, head up to the northern city of Haifa, which overlooks the Mediterranean, or the southern city of Be'er Sheba in the heart of the Israeli desert. No matter where you go, you'll get an authentic taste of the Holy Land, Ir or no Ir. Let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Wednesday is expected to be partly cloudy with a high of 83 degrees. The sun should be back out shining by Thursday with a high of 85. All right, everybody, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.75 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV, and don't forget to check out our next update at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks for watching, and see you tonight.